Hey, hi, hello. I am John Wolf, also known as Super Dude or Super. Today, I'm going to be talking about something. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about some anime ass stuff today. So, if none of you guys are into that, I invite you to run away. Also, for some reason, the chapters aren't working on my videos anymore because God hates me. So, you can find those in the description below along with a couple of other little snippets. So, make sure to look there if you're trying to find something specific. Uh, but otherwise, yeah! Fire Emblem is a strategy game series developed by Intelligent Systems and published by Nintendo. It is a strategy game that essentially only released in Japan and was a complete unknown to most of the world until Smash Brothers decided to feature some of the characters in Smash Brothers Melee and launched the series onto the world stage. It has since developed into a respectable series that releases... interesting games, let's go with that. Fire Emblem's notable feature is that their units are people. They have personalities, odd quirks, things that they want to do with their lives, sometimes backstories and secrets. The fact that I said sometimes have backstories should clue you into the character depth in some of these. It's more a shape, a silhouette of a person, and it's about the impression you make on the character than their actual mannerisms. See, it's a lot like Garrus from the Mass Effect series. People remember him as being this really cuddly bear of a dude, but no, he isn't. He's actually one of the more renegade people. Like in Mass Effect 2, he talks about <laughs> actively just shooting randomly into uh, Omega and just whoever it is is uh, probably a villain, so it's fine. And in the first game, you can hear him talk all the time about how all of this red tape is annoying and that way they should just take crime into their own hands as if that isn't how police brutality happens. And <laughs> it's like, Garrus, Garrus, you are taking the wrong lessons from Spectre's dude. Sorry, I got distracted. The units in game are people with personalities, more or less. That's part one. Part two is that they can eat crap and die. This combination of characters with personalities and that those personalities can enter the void has some interesting implications. One, you could lose your units. That sucks. But what sucks more is if that unit is gone, its utility is lost for the rest of the game. This gives you a reason to be a bit more precious about your guys. But second thing this does is it makes you predisposed to caring about some of the characters in the game. As an example, this here is Bernadetta. She never leaves her room unless some event commands her presence, and she is neurotically shy. Most of her conversations involve her losing her marbles about something completely inconsequential and running away from the other party. This is a human bunny rabbit, and she means everything to me. If Bernie were to die? No more conversations, no more odd quirks, she in the ground. And as a result, I will protect her to the grave. She's always standing right beside me. It doesn't help that she's one of the only archer units in the squad, and she rules mechanically as well. This is why I mentioned earlier that they sometimes have backstory secrets and ambitions. If they're more silhouettes and impressions of characters than actually well-defined ones, it allows you to fill in the blanks with what you think this person would be like, and perhaps slot in someone that you know for this person, doing a lot of the legwork for the game in your head. So with a game that's predisposed to making you care about someone in it, how do they capitalize on that strength? By being as melodramatic as possible. The stories of Fire Emblem are tropey as heck and will milk it for all emotion that it's worth. Death of a parental figure. Dramatic sword crossings between old friends. Basically every single death line that any character has in the game. Mother, I will see you soon. My dreams and pride lost. Must I die on foreign soil? <laughs> Fire Emblem is a certain kind of soap opera trash which is delightful to consume, but that changed somewhat recently. With the release of Fire Emblem Three Houses, Intelligent System went bigger with its story than ever before, and created a politically charged world with ambiguous villains where no matter what side you were on, you're never working with all the information you'd like. It led to a vast world with lots of information to chew on, and people are still discussing the story and its minutia to this day. But that was the last Fire Emblem. New kid on the block is Fire Emblem Engage, which takes an insanely different direction with its tone, its story, and its mechanics. This is as far removed from Three Houses' whole idea as you could possibly be while still being recognizably Fire Emblem, but it's still good? This game rocks! I want to discuss why that is. What is it about Three Houses that makes it great? And what makes Engage great? And why are they completely different reasons?
Some quick history for you. Intelligent Systems began their life as a company that made development tools. After porting a couple of games, they made a strategy game called Famicom Wars, though it is probably more recognizable by its more famous sequel, Advanced Wars, which took off on the Game Boy Advance years later. This is the first one of those. I've never played any of the Wars games, so moving on. Two years later, they produced their next original IP, Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light. Pretty cool game. It's where this guy comes from. From 1990 to 2002 are games that only came out in Japan, in a time period sometimes called the Unlocalized Era. We never got these, and some of them we still haven't. I'm saying all this from a United States perspective, by the way. In 2001, a game released for the GameCube called Super Smash Bros. Melee, which featured Marth and Roy, the first and last protagonist of the series, respectively. They were among the few sword users in that game alongside Link. Link, however, is a zoner, meaning he does a good job of keeping people away with his specials, so his sword is less an integral part of his game plan. Not for these two. Roy is an active close-range engager, where the base of his sword is the hardest-hitting part, so he wants to be on top of you, a relentless engager. Mars' sword is quite the opposite. He deals the most damage at the tip, meaning he's trying to keep a certain distance from you to constantly hit you with the sword's edge. Roy's wild dog style and Marth's fencing style were super distinct, and that raised the question, who the hell are these guys? The world got its first taste of Fire Emblem, and so we received the newest games, as well as some ports of the original six in what is called the localization era, or sometimes the port era. Despite the greater stage, Fire Emblem suffered financially during this time, leading to Nintendo threatening intelligence systems with the plug if they don't make money on their next game. Sound familiar? What intelligence did next defied expectations. They didn't just do well, they smashed it. Enter Fire Emblem Awakening, which introduced many new tropes into the series. It also introduced... other qualities. This is, depending on who you ask, the last or current era of Fire Emblem. Welcome to the horny era, or anime era for the kids. Fire Emblem leans into some interesting designs for this one. A breeding mechanic where units can have children, and those children are miraculously old enough to fight through some magic explanation. It's different from game to game. These children inherit strengths of their parents, meaning you're breeding for good children. Weird stuff. It also added some of the more, um, intense designs in the game so far. <laughs> Petting! All sorts of stuff that, for people who've never seen how weird anime can get, is probably completely alienating. Despite that, this was the best-selling game in the series' history, followed by the next game, and the next one as well. The strategy of going very anime was very successful at getting butts in seats. Weeb butts. With the series at its highest, where did they go next? In a surprise turn, Intelligent Systems got ambitious and took the series in a much more serious direction. Fire Emblem Three Houses is a tactical role-playing game that released in 2019 for the Nintendo Switch. It smashed multiple sales records in multiple countries upon release, and is still the most successful Fire Emblem in terms of sales, though the most recent hasn't had time to catch up, so perhaps that is unfair. The game centers Byleth, a very reserved child to Geralt, uh, Geralt, a famous mercenary. You soon after beginning the game come into contact with some rich kids who need help not dying. These are Claude, Dimitri, and Edelgard, and these are the leaders of the three different houses of a nearby school, Garrig Mach. Garrig Mach is both an academy, a monastery, and the closest thing this world has to a Vatican. Why they're all together, away from their respective schools being attacked by bandits, seems almost convenient, but whatever. Some of the knights recognize your father from his days working at Garrig Mach and mention that there is a position of knight captain that needs filled, and your father is perfect for the role. Reluctant, but unable to say no, he sets off for Garrig Mach with little old you in tow. Upon arriving, it turns out that there's an empty teaching position that needs to be fulfilled as well. How convenient! So you are tasked with teaching one of the classes of your choosing, and work in Garrick Mach alongside your father. Each of the houses represents a different ruling body of the region of Fodlan, and the students, with some exceptions, hail from this continent. This school is a prestigious one, so you're dancing toe-to-toe -to -toe with royalty and nobles in most conversations, though there are some common folks sprinkled among them to communicate what general life is like in each of the ruling bodies. Each house has different preferences for magic, martial arts, and archery, which will affect how you build your strategy from the jump, but perhaps more importantly, they each have distinct storylines from each other. Each leader of the houses is an heir to their respective throne, and have opinions on what their kingdom should do for their people and for the world. This shapes the direction the story takes, and after a climactic midsection, the stories truly blossom into their own wildly distinct directions compared to the other routes. Lots of pressure for a decision made in the first hour. Regardless of your decision, the gameplay loop is the same. 
Much like in Persona 5, the actual story content that progresses things happens at the end of the month, so you have four weeks to prepare for that conflict. Each weekend, you have an amount of free time that you can use to perform various activities around the monastery. Use them how you like. Praying, eating with students or colleagues, participating in arena matches. Take your favorite person out to tea to establish a stronger bond to unlock more conversations with them. Do whatever. During the week, you instruct your students on skills to grow in or study upon, have students partake in various chores for extra skill gain and bonding between students as an added bonus, and answer their student questions in a way that is both helpful and something they might actually do. Then, you do battle, and... Let's consider for a moment what Fire Emblem is all about. Fire Emblem as a series is built on two pillars, strategy and story. These two pillars are the reason people come to Fire Emblem at all, so they both need to be strong to support the game. How does Three Houses hold its pillars? Eh, okay. The battle portions of the game are larger than they've ever been before, thanks to the power of the Switch. Hilarious statement, I know. Battles can easily last over 20 rounds in the endgame, and with 15 units under your control, and significantly more on the enemy side, that means each turn runs long. Here are some of the things you'll be thinking about during those turns. Enemies have a range of influence, so you want to place units that can take hits if you aren't going to kill the enemy outright. If the enemy has high defense, that means they're a beefcake, and you can take care of them with brains rather than brawn. If enemy has high resistance, then they're a nerd and you take care of them like we did back in the day. <laughs> to be very clear, I myself was a big geek, I was definitely not one of these guys. If they don't have either high defense nor resistance, then that probably means they're a rogue and you want to kill them before they get any chance to move on you. And if they have high of both, then you can use this game's new innovation in the strategy layer, the battalions, causing special debuffs to the enemies while leaving you in relative safety. If the enemy's flying, shoot them with a bow. If they have bows, don't bring your flyers close. And that is all of the tactical considerations you need to make in Three Houses. That was only a paragraph long. This is the thing about Three Houses. The fights are long, and a bit boring. If you play on harder difficulties, this gets more thoughtful and interesting, and there's more to it than what I said, but it doesn't matter if you're playing on normal. Three Houses is so easy, they added a harder difficulty into the game with a patch, so the strategy in this STRATEGY role-playing game is pretty boring. So why is it the best-selling Fire Emblem to date? I'll tell you, it's the story. Remember the introduction to Byleth I said about minutes back? Basically every other sentence I said was a lie. Whether an outright lie or a mission, so much of what I told you was incorrect or could be expanded upon because this game's world is dense. Each house of characters is fleshing out a different ruling body and exploring different aspects of the world's lore. You learn over the course of each distinct house's campaign different viewpoints of various factions within the world. Lightning fast, lightly spoilery, mystery round, go. Is the Pope a trustworthy person? Isn't it kind of weird that she cracked open the red carpet for you and Geralt upon arrival? What is she planning? In some stories, you're kissing her feet the entire campaign, and in others... <laughs> who's the real bad guy of this game? What the heck happened in Vargas four years ago? I'm sorry, what are the details of the child experiment done in Adrestia? It wasn't even the first time? Why is Flane so cagey about her age? Is she a prisoner of war? The characters in this game have ambitions and backstories rarely rivaled in Fire Emblem's history. Forget the one personality template of the older games, these people have depth. Some exceptions apply. And that gives people more to talk about and chew on, especially since the world cannot be viewed from one angle. Here's an example, Byleth. I told you earlier Byleth is a very reserved person. What I meant is Byleth basically never shows emotion and only speaks when spoken to. People around Byleth regard this as notably odd and bring up constantly if they do express emotion. We call this sort of character a silent protagonist, and they appear in all sorts of video games. Silent protagonists exist to be a gray blob of sorts that you can place yourself inside of. They're avatars of your player experience, holding no personality or opinions so that you can just pretend you're them. It's an immersion tactic. But Byleth is a little different because the aspects of silent protagonists that Byleth exhibits are constantly being pointed out to you. This causes the effect to not work at all and instead draw attention to itself. What's up with Byleth? Why are they this way? You know what? It is weird that Isaac never says anything despite the horrors he's witnessing. Byleth, what's happened to you? And like all things in Three Houses, certain routes through the game aren't even remotely concerned with answering this question. If you want to get a clear picture of Three Houses, you need to beat the game at least twice, if not do every house once. And this is what gives Three Houses its staying power. If you can handle the hundreds of hours needed to beat the game twice or three times, ooh baby, you're armed with information. You are able to see the political mural of Fodlin for what it is and decide for yourself who is the most correct. And believe you me, no one agrees. 
When the chips are down and the antagonist appears, people have feelings about it, and people are still arguing on whether the villains of this game are right or wrong. They wrote a game where each character is as incapable of seeing the entire picture as we are through one playthrough, and make decisions on imperfect information. They have flaws, do bad things, sometimes morally wrong things, in the service of their own goals, ambitions, or just mindsets on how the world should work. Are these goals noble or misguided? People are still arguing over that, and it's given the game a lot of life past its campaigns. This part isn't scripted, I just need to talk about the music in this game. The music is insane. There's such a wild range of emotions that this game has. A lot of it is heroic, uh, but <laughs> it, it, not all of it. And it's just great, filled with evocative emotion. I mean, if the game is supposed to be a soap opera RPG, then the music better be really hammy, and it, it hams it up, believe you me. Uh, there, there's a villain in this game whose music is dubstep, so every time they're on screen, it plays dubstep, and that is completely disorienting in a <laughs> fantasy game. I've been playing most of my favorites the entire times uh, that this video has been playing, so just look in the description for the songs if you have interest in seeing further. Um, I'm also going to say one song which is really great, but it's kind of a spoiler, so just skip ahead five seconds if you, it really matters to you. Funeral Flowers. Uh, that song's great. Um, yeah, so plenty of great songs in here, and the game is lousy with leitmotif. It has leitmotif all over it. So if you're really into analyzing song meanings through its melodies and its harmonies, like Undertale from the past, this game has that as well. Look into it. It's great. Up on the opposite end of the spectrum, from everything I just talked about, there's Fire Emblem Engage. Releasing at the beginning of this year, Fire Emblem Engage could not be farther removed from the previous entry. Engage is about Elir, who is the Divine Dragon. Quick aside, dragons are immensely powerful beings that tend to take human form for convenience's sake. From game to game, the rules can change on what exactly this means, but dragons, they are a thing. As I said, Pepsi here is the Divine Dragon, and has been asleep for a thousand years since a battle in ages past. Their awakening coincides with the awakening of the Fell Dragon, Sombron, and both factions work at collecting all the emblem rings before the other. The Emblem Rings are rings that contain the souls of the previous Fire Emblem game protagonists, and allow characters to enhance themselves with abilities reminiscent of that character from their original game. Couple of notes up front, when someone mentions an evil dragon, a lot of Fire Emblem fans start going to sleep. We've had... many. Many evil dragon plots in the series' run, so when it was revealed that this is what Engage is about, most fans were clued in at what this meant, and it was going to be a lot less serious than Three Houses. Second, the fan service rings. This is corny. It is a thinly veiled attempt at fan service, but again, that's fine if you know what you're getting into. To be fair to Engage, it is trying to signal very hard what kind of game it is. I mean, look at Alir. Pepsi Man and Woman here are a pretty massive indicator that you're in for an anime as hell experience. Homie look like a JoJo character. The game begins and takes its sweet time ramping up to anything interesting. We walk through tropes of the series on our way to some of the first real missions of the game, Around the time where you get this princess character is when things start getting interesting. Each mission, they're introducing some mechanic to you that layers on top of the base level tactics of the series, so by the time you've reached this point, there's kind of a lot on your plate. In games past, there was this concept of the weapon triangle, a rock-paper-scissors where some weapon types have advantage over other types. Three Houses skipped this mechanic, but in Engage it comes back with a vengeance, adding break into the mix. When you use a weapon against an opponent with advantage in the weapon triangle, you force them to drop their weapon, leaving them defenseless against the next attack. This could be used to finish the target by a different party member who's weak against that weapon, or letting a weaker unit kill them to gain the experience with no danger of retaliation. There are individual units that have different effects on the field independent of their weapon type. Backup units deal extra damage during a different unit's turn as long as they're directly beside the enemy, meaning they want to be right in the action, complementing longer-ranged allies. Covert units gain extra bonuses from terrain effects, meaning they want to use the environment to their advantage. Shout out to the Thief, their poison debuff makes enemies easier to hurt with other units, and the poison snacks making them a really great health debuffer. Armored is self-explanatory, I don't need to hold your hands. Body art users tend to be buffers, but also have access to a flurry of blows that can be useful for taking out low defense units. They also enjoy the Chain Guard ability, which allows them to perfectly block damage from adjacent allies at the cost of their own HP, but they can only do this at full health. These options make body art units exceptionally versatile, but they're always weak, meaning their utility has to be weighed against your willingness to put them in mortal danger. Remember, in Fire Emblem, if you lose a unit, it's gone forever. 
Mystic Units, which are Magic Units, pretty self-explanatory, and finally, the Cavalry and Flying Classes, which enjoy greater movement than all the other classes, with Flying having the unfortunate side effect of not being able to benefit from any terrain effects. But god they're fast. And again, these unit types are independent of weapon choice, so each unit brings something different even inside of their own mechanical niche. And that is before mentioning the Emblem Rings at all. God, the rings. Each ring brings a range of buffs that affects the unit on multiple levels, changing up the tactics used considerably. They have their passive buffs, which tend to give the unit some stat increases or extra ability, which is nice, I suppose, but there's also their engage ability. Activating the ring causes the two to fuse together into cohesive whole, and they gain completely new powers. An extra special effect, which tends to be an attack with some other benefit outside of just outright damage, and tends to be the strongest moves available to you in the game. The ring and the unit have a bond level, showing the connection between the fan service character and your unit, which allows for later effects, including but not limited to extra fan service weapons to use, more passives you gain just for wearing the ring, different weapon proficiencies to change how the original unit operates on the triangle, or perhaps change their abilities entirely, and later, the ability to inherit these skills to the original unit, giving them the engage ring's powers without the ring needing to be worn at all. The rings bring such a huge benefit that any unit wearing one is massively benefited and changed, and with only one exception, the rings do not have an obvious choice for who should use them. If you invest in a bond between a ring and a unit, you can give anyone some abilities that make their tactics completely distinct, and maybe even improve the unit. I haven't even told you about everything, but I've already been talking for so long about the tactical layer compared to Three Houses. Engage's fights are harder and denser, but more rewarding puzzles than Three Houses ever was. And that rules. But Engage is more than its tactics, isn't it? As I said earlier, Engage's story is kind of road at this point, but actually experiencing the thing is a different story. This story is funny, and I'm not sure if that's on purpose. It is so very dumb, and I'm convinced it knows that at least a little? The character designs are insane. Here is the introduction of the prince that is kind of your number two for the entire game. Here is his sister. This is her battle outfit. This character has her abs exposed non-stuff so you know she's tough. This character has tiny head. This is the thief character who says some wild crap to you when you meet them. Look at her. Look at her. This is a villain. This is her older sister. Here's some other villain. They're all insane! When the story is trying to be serious, it either goes for too long or uses some well-trodden tropes of the series that would surprise nobody. So, it's either being completely goofed up, or when it's being serious, it's completely boring and you know exactly what is happening. The game is leaning full anime, and it knows it's doing that, and it does not care. Here are some of the events that you can get up to outside of combat. Petting and dressing up your special spirit dog that... does that when you take care of them. Picking fruits with your buds. Going swimming playing dress-up, tending to the farm animals, polish the rings while the soul inside of the ring judges you for how you do it. This raises your bond. Squats. Sharing a meal with friends, sleep, and be woken up by one of your party members in a scene that I can only call cringe and insane and- Sound crazy. asleep, huh? I, why did they make I know that sleepy face so well. But you better wake up soon, or it's tickle time. The Divine Dragon is awake! <laughs> Feeling a bit of deja vu? Well, good morning. Three Houses, in some people's minds, seems like we had exited the anime era, so to speak, which some had been maligning for a while. But one game removed from a design trend is not a new era make. Engage crashes right back to Earth with some of the most weeb crap imaginable, and I'm forced to contend with the fact that no, this is what I'm championing. This is what I'm asking y'all to try out. I don't know, dude. I just don't know. It's so corny and cringe, and yet the tactics are fantastic and have forced me to consider my actions more than I've had to in years of playing Three Houses. This game is blurst, and while neither of the two subjects in this video are perfect, they excel in areas its companion does not, and it's almost uncanny that this is the case. Intelligent systems can't make the perfect Fire Emblem, they only have so much creative juice, and they can either make a compelling story, or make a compelling tactics game, and I genuinely don't know which is better or which is worse. I guess let me know what you think in the comments, but between you and me, there are corners of the internet where this war is waging, and I genuinely don't see a winner here. It just depends on who you are, and while I lean in this direction, you should really try them both out if you have a stomach for anime crap. Remember, you have been warned, and I hope you like it.
Rabbit fast conclusion for those in the back who decided to skip to the end of the video. By the way, that's really rude, I work hard on these and I would just really like some appreciation. Thanks to Smash Brothers, Fire Emblem is a series of tactics games that have taken the world by storm, at least in Nintendo's corner of things. The game has gone in a wildly anime direction since Awakening, and then boom, Fire Emblem Three Houses comes out. A tactics game where the tactics are and, but the story is what? It features characters with opposing worldviews fighting it out, and a game with mysteries and secrets which you can't learn everything about in a single playthrough. Learning who's right and who's wrong depends on where you stand and what you've learned, and there's no one right answer, leading to an interesting plot to chew on. Following that is Fire Emblem Engage, a dumb as rocks, cringe as hell anime tactics game where the tactics are genuinely interesting and require some legitimate thought, performing a complete 180 from the previous title in terms of what's interesting and what's boring. Both are valid, both are good, try them out, if you have like 300 hours to spare. I am Super Dude, thanks for watching. Hello and hi again, how are you? I'm a really big fan of Fire Emblem, especially Three Houses. Three Houses really blew me away compared to everything else in the series. I'm a big fan of, I don't know, garbage? <laughs> uh, soap opera crap? Uh, I eat it up, apparently. I didn't know that about myself before I started playing this series, but when Engage was announced, I wasn't expecting anything great from it. Uh, so to find that it actually has some something of redeeming value was interesting, and I wanted to talk about it, and I thank you for listening. Um, I have a Twitch, uh, you, sometimes I play games on it, go ahead and head over if that interests you at all. Uh, other than that, I'm actually gonna start making some more game design videos soon, so for those of you who liked my first video, uh, you will find something a little bit more akin to that soon, so look forward to that. Um, yeah, thank you very much, I'm Superdude, see you when I do.